morning, everyone. Uh, my iPhone says it's 10.30 on the dot, so we're going to start and try to be punctual and respect your time. Roger and I have both many things to say, um, and uh, we do want to make sure that we allow time for discussion at the end. So uh, we will not elaborate on everything we talk about. Uh, we have a lot of um, thoughts, and, and we think it's a very timely discussion um, about evidence-based practice. Um, we really want to thank the organizing committee for inviting us to uh, give the opportunity to present and discuss these ideas. And Roger and I both feel quite passionate that this is an important topic at this time of, in our profession. And we all recognize that research is a really important part of what we do, and the term evidence-based practice uh, is now about 20 years old. And uh, as Roger's uh, title of his section uh, is, speaks to is that it's time to evaluate what the evidence for the intervention of, inter of evidence-based practice is. Uh, we, we really respect uh, that both, ultimately, both clinicians and researchers are having the aim of facilitating the best decisions for our patients and best outcomes. So we're all on the same page there. It's a matter of what's the best way to get there. So uh, we are looking forward to your, your questions and discussion, and by no means are we aiming to be negative, but I'm sure we will raise some controversial things, and that's okay, because discussion is a good thing, and it's a way we move forward. Uh, my name is Linda Joy Lee. Uh, you can call me LJ, and, or Linda Joy. Just There's a hyphen there, so remember, hyphen. Um, and uh, I'm originally from Vancouver, that beautiful place in the left-hand corner. Uh, I work at uh, my own private practice called Synergy Physio, and I'm in partnership with uh, Diane Lee and our educational company called Discover Physio. <coughs> I'm also half Australian. Uh, I am half Korean, that's the Lee, and I'm half Australian, and I have spent the last several years, eight years, traveling back and forth between Vancouver and Queensland, uh, doing my PhD part-time at the University of Queensland, and my thesis has been accepted. I just need to do final revision, so um, it's not official yet, so there's just PT and physio behind there, but um, um, I'm almost finished my PhD. Uh, Roger, uh, I'm an orthopedic manual therapist. I was trained in the Canadian system, uh, did my manual therapy training here, um, which I feel very privileged and, and uh, grateful for because it's very specific in, in my manual skills. So. Uh, I bring those things forward as well. So I wear sort of both the clinician and the researcher hat as does Roger Carey. Now, I met Roger first in Montreal, so we have a French connection. Uh, we uh, were both uh, keynotes at the orthopedic, Canadian Orthopedic Symposium in 2008, which was on clinical reasoning, and uh, Mark Jones was there as well, and we really enjoyed listening to Roger, Diane and I, and we went, oh, this explains how we think, and we like this abductive reasoning and hypothetical deductive, and I've always been interested in philosophy, so uh, Roger captured my attention, and we kind of grabbed him and said, let's go for dinner and have some chats. And I also was invited to speak and open a conference in the UK for Physio First in 2011, last year, and they asked me to speak to the topic of research or clinical practice, which is the driver? And I was a little bit scared about presenting that topic. And so I armed myself for about 18 months before the presentation, reading and discussing and sending Roger my email sewing, saying, do you have an article for this? And what is the definition of, um, I don't even know some of those words, Est epistemological necessity, blah, blah. I needed a dictionary for reading these papers. So I have Roger to thank for expanding my um, appreciation of the topic matter. And Roger is a course leader for postgraduate manual therapy program at the University of Nottingham, so he too uh, wears a clinical hat. Many of you are probably familiar with his work in cervical artery dysfunction, um, and I know he has been speaking about that here at this conference. Uh, what you might not know is about his other life. He's also currently undertaking a PhD at the University of Nottingham in the Department of Philosophy about the philosophy of science behind evidence-based practice. Now, don't get scared. I've asked him not to use lots of big words. So uh, we sort of, over this discussions we've had and uh, coffees, and when I've taught in the UK, we've, we've met up, and uh, we, that's where the idea to come together and put the symposium together came from. And we're really excited to share this dialogue with you today. So uh, 
I, I thought it quite hilarious and I emailed Krim, I said, wow, I have an elephant driving uh, in, in my presentation. Uh, and so uh, I, we uh, were looking at, look at the, the driver of the elephant and the path we're taking in evidence-based practice. Um, and we must start to admit that there are some emotional things to the positions we hold in evidence-based practice, that it's not purely logical, the decisions we make. First question we're going to talk about, and I'll discuss this briefly in my introduction, is that we have to consider the definition of evidence-based practice and our definitions. We have some challenges about how we all use this word. And uh, <coughs> then we're going to be treated to Roger's discussions about what is the evidence for evidence-based practice. And looking at this, that evidence-based practice is a relatively new intervention to physiotherapy. Uh, is there good evidence for this intervention? He will then go on to talk about the hierarchies and how we value uh, different types of evidence. Uh, Roger's going to talk about predictive outcomes. Does science actually give us the ability to predict the future? And, and how are we using science in our, in our practices and in our assumptions in our research? Uh, do scientific studies prove uh, that things are true? So this is sort of the study of, of truth and epistemology, and don't worry, we're not going to talk about Plato. Um, and oh, how, well. oh, maybe you will. Okay, right, Roger will, sorry. Um, how does population data relate to individual clinical decisions? So we kind of have a blend of, you know, someone said, is this a clinical discussion? Is this a, a theoretical thing? It's kind of both because those worlds need to overlap to give us best clinical decisions. But at the end of the day, the topic is about making wise clinical decisions. And so that's where I'm going to go and sort of bring some things together and um, look at how we make uh, decisions in the clinic based on knowledge, based on scientific evidence, where does it fit? How does this all come together? What are our current paradigms? And where should we go? What should drive clinical decisions? Uh, science, clinical expertise, where do we put this all together? So we want to uh, really end with um, sort of some of our thoughts about where evidence-based practice needs to go. Uh, is this a good term? What do we do? And how do we move physiotherapy forward? And we really are looking forward to, as I said, our discussions together. Now, evidence-based practice, um, is used a lot. We've heard a lot at this conference. Uh, the AOMT conference is using the three pillars as, as framing their conference for next October. And uh, uh, many people and many websites will say, oh, uh, we are an evidence-based practice clinic or I'm an evidence-based practice practitioner. Uh, what does this all mean? And uh, Diane and I, over our teaching experience, have had lots of different uh, reflections and we've had a different experiences that have framed sort of our perception of how people use this word. And Roger and I were talking about it, we thought, let's do a survey. Uh, because, first of all, what is evidence? And if you ask people to define it, they give different definitions, and then there's a colloquial way we use this word. And commonly, people mean scientific evidence when they use the word evidence, okay? And yet, sometimes when we discuss it, then sometimes it will come out that we mean other things. So we actually pressed people to, ref to do this. And this survey, some of you have maybe seen us, we've said, fill it out. Um, and we, we don't want to get you to fill it out anymore after this because we're hoping you'll be biased after our discussions today because <laughs> we wanted a clean data set. So we got about, what is it, 400 and 530 responses, okay? And when we say, what would you say counts as evidence in evidence-based practice? 90% of people gave that response that it's science, okay? Because only about 10% of the respondents included something other than systematic published research, okay? So only a few other people included patient values, their clinical experiences, their clinical evidence as part of the word evidence. And about 70% of the responses to define evidence actually use the term RCT. So it, it's not just all research, it's a very specific kind of research. And it was interesting because this sort of uh, relates to uh, our experiences. And often, well, I've been at conferences or I've been in discussion with people where evidence just means research. Uh, or evidence only means a certain subgroup of research, uh, RCTs and systematic reviews of, of, of science and of RCTs. And um, then other people will say, well, no, it means all of our knowledge uh, from all sources. And um, yesterday, uh, a few days ago, Joy McDermott talked about the Paris knowledge translation model from the nursing literature. And she said what she liked about it was that the first component, what is the evidence in this model, included evidence from all sources, including local setting information and hospitals. So there's clearly some discrepancies about how we talk about it. 
And I'd say probably my experiences have been in our survey which show that this word more commonly is used to mean that evidence equals research science and is for some people only RCTs. Okay? So we have different views of the evidence. Uh, it either means all research or it means very specific types of research. Um, for some people, that research then creates clinical guidelines that direct our decisions. And then other people on the other end of the spectrum would say, well, actually, no, our clinical expertise is what guides our wise decisions. So are we all on the same page? And then you have experiences, in, and this is a direct quote at a conference um, that was World Congress of Low Back and Pelvic Riddle Pain, uh, and Moritz Van Tulder, who said, we should not start using interventions until there is sufficient evidence for them. And by this, he meant RCTs and systematic reviews. And so there is a wide variety of things, and I'm not saying that this is everyone's point of view, but certainly it's one we've come across quite frequently, and this radically changes how we work in practice. So that's much more of a hierarchy of things reaching down from the research and clinical practice guidelines into clinical practice. And yet the original definitions by Sackett and group was that it's actually an integration of clinical expertise with the best available research evidence. And that we use both individual clinical expertise and research with neither alone being enough. And it's best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values together, these three balls the combining of these three diverse parts into a complex whole that makes evidence-based practice. And what's really interesting is that what you can see just from the short discussion is that there seems to be the differences in opinion about how we practice evidence-based practice, how we use it every day with our patients is really about the importance or weight placed on each of these different components, especially the research ball and the clinical expertise. And certainly our experience has been that this is heavily focused on the research. So I'm going to turn it over to Roger, and he's going to talk about now the evidence for evidence-based practice. So thank, thank you to LJ, thank you to ICOM for facilitating this, thank you all for attending. Um, so yeah, LJ says I can't talk about philosophy and I can't talk about maths. So I've got very little to offer other than the works of Johnny Cash between 1962 and 1996. <laughs> um, but, so I'll try and do my best. So, um, okay, this is, uh, we're in for a bit of a rocky ride over the next 25 minutes or so, so hang in there. Um, I'm gonna tell you about some of the work we've done at Nottingham about this, this very issue. So it's trying to find the evidence for evidence-based practice. This is the evidence, in evidence-based practice, good evidence or not, is it doing? Um, what it is doing. So, um, let's see. <coughs> so, a brief history of physiotherapy. Uh, so, LJ says that evidence-based practice is a relatively new intervention, and uh, what she means by that is what we think of the EBP tripartite model at the moment. Of course, evidence-based practice is not new. It's as old as uh, humanity itself. People who interfere with other people, which is what we do, um, <laughs> I've, I've always tried to do that if they're genuine people in, in the best way possible. So people have always used some sort of evidence, whether it was the position of the moon in the, in the sky or whether it was the way uh, the wind blows or whatever. There's always been some sort of evidence. And up until this, this point here, perhaps we could say a valid source of evidence was things like uh, clinical judgment and appealing to clinical expertise as a source of evidence. Then this little fella comes along in the early 90s and we think of something different um, about uh, evidence-based practice now. So this is what I'm interested in. What impact has this had on our, on our profession? Or rather, how, at least how do we establish, how we understand what impact that has had on? Because what I'll tell you is it's a very complex notion. So here we are again and sat right in the middle of that is our wise clinical decision making. Um, and um, as LJ says, it seems that over the last 20 years or so, this has taken some sort of supremacy over these sources of evidence. And there's a m multiple sources of information where we can get that from, things like our survey or things like, you know, you're not gonna get funding as, as easily for this as you are for something up here, the way commissioners, uh, in the UK at least, the way commission, commissioners commission health policy is based on this. So there's all these different layers of information that say there is some sort of uh, supremacy of, of how we weight evidence within that. Um, actually, hooray, time for celebration. So if we take, um, 
if we take Gordon Guyatt's 1991 ACP uh, J article as the birth of the modern model of evidence-based practice, then we've got cause to celebrate its 21-year-old uh, model this year. Hooray. Okay, so we're not alone in sort of questioning um, the issues about evidence-based practice. There's a plethora, there's, there's, there's masses of literature out there asking really sort of important questions. Uh, problems of the evidence in evidence-based medicine. Evidence of evidence is not necessarily evidence. This is what I'm really interested in. How do we get, get that? Um, attitudes towards something called epistemic risk. And uh, that, that's the belief that, that we're, we're interpreting data in a way that it's not really supposed to be interpreted. So I'll put my hands up from the start. My, my position is I think we're misinterpreting research data and, and drawing something out of it that it isn't meant to, to do. So we're, 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 we're going along this line of epistemic um, risk. Um, the, uh, Nancy Cartwright is a big writer on, on the role that RCTs play in the evidence-based medicine model, and Adam McCas from, U, um, uh, from uh, Queensland has, has wrote, written a lot about what evidence-based medicine can be and can't be. Um, so what is evidence? So this is what we think of evidence. I'll, I'll talk exclusively about evidence for therapeutic interventions, not diagnosis or prognosis or harm, but uh, therapeutics. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this. This is what we count of evidence. There's some sort of hierarchy here where the stuff at the top, we, we put more weight in on this than we do this when we're trying to either make policy or clinical decisions, or at least we're supposed to. Okay, so mechanistic studies and reasoning, laboratory studies, expert opinion come at the bottom, systematic reviews of good trials at the top and N of 1 trials above that. And there are reasons for that. But I want to unpack a bit more about what evidence really is, or at least, at least should be. Okay, so evidence has got to be related to something. You can't just have something and call it evidence. So. If I got a certificate of attendance for this iPhone conference, that certificate would be evidence of me attending the conference. I can't just get a piece of paper which is unrelated to anything and say this, this is evidence. So evidence has got to be evidence of something. And usually we say that's of some sort of uh, idea or question or, or hypothesis. So my certificate of attendance is evidence of the, the hypothesis of did I attend iPhone 2012 or not. But then that hypothesis has got to be grounded in something very meaningful and substantial that forms the basis of what evidence is. Some, some real well-defined and, and well-accepted theory or concept. So, for example, my certificate idea could be grounded in the notion of uh, learning or continuing <coughs> professional development or something like that. <coughs> so evidence has got at least three sort of layers to it. And we need to understand the importance and the stability of all three of these layers before we can start to understand what evidence really is. In our interventions idea, so an RCT or systematic review would be evidence of some hypothesis related to treatment efficacy which would be grounded in some broad notion related to causation, what causes health status uh, to change. So this needs to be thoroughly in place to establish a good one of these to understand whether evidence is doing its job or not. And then we need to ask, okay, <laughs> so what is the evidence for E actually being E and not some random unrelated notion? And that's not easy to do, okay? So I'm going to try and approach it by four different dimensions. One, to look at clinical research and clinical observations as evidence for evidence. One, to look at a more focused look at the scientific mechanics of evidence to establish whether evidence is evidence within evidence-based practice. <laughs> then to go a bit deeper to look at the, how we generate knowledge to see if that can give us clues to whether the evidence is good evidence. And then a bit deeper still and look at some grounded ontological um, reasons and, and mechanics of, of whether evidence is good <coughs> evidence or not. So hang in there. So first of all, clinical. So it's very intuitive and it's very appealing to say, okay, we've, got, we've, got, um, we've done some trials, we've done some systematic reviews, we've got some clinical guidelines, we'll plug those into clinical practice. Now let's research the clinical practice to see if the evidence is working or not in practice. And we've seen examples of that um, 
uh, grow over the last few years and, and there's been presentations at this conference about looking at clinical practice to see if the evidence is doing its job or not in practice. So that, that's a very nice thing to think about and a nice <coughs> thing to do. Um, uh, so, but I'll propose that it fails. Um, th and the other thing to think about is our own clinical experiences and things like, well, 70% of the respondents on the, on the survey, for example, we ask a question about, do you think evidence-based practice has improved your clinical practice? And 70% of respondents said, yes, they think since they've been doing EBP, they're getting better clinical outcomes, and that's great. But it's, do, it's not evidence, as I'll explain. Okay, so, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, I'm doing your presentation now, Jane. So are other RCTs and observational studies good tests of evidence, e.g. RCTs being good evidence? So um, this is where I can mention Plato, but just for two, two seconds. So this falls foul to a simple platonic paradox of enquiry. What we're trying to do, what we're saying here is quite simply, we've, we've, we've undertaken a method of enquiry, and then we're testing whether that method of enquiry is subs it works or not by using the same method of enquiry. You, you just can't do it. it. It has no logical, scientific, philosophical, common sense uh, way to justify you can do that. That's compounded further by the increasing risk of bias of the secondary level of, of observational study or uh, randomised controlled trial as well. And it's compounded at a third level by the increasing chance of a false positive in multiple tests of a single hypothesis. So we get a paradox of enquiry and we get increasing risk of bias and it, it's just not common sense to use the same method to test uh, if a method has worked or not. With regards to clinical observations, since I've been using EBP, my clinical outcomes are better. Well, what we had before 1991, let's say, are clinical observations, and we used to say, yeah, I get patients better. Then some people came along and said, well, your perceptions are full of bias. We need methods with less bias to see that. So we do those methods of less bias, produce results plug them into practice, and then suddenly to try and use, go back to the pre-1991 idea of my clinical observations, I see better outcomes. Well, we've, we've, we've really gone back there. We're really using a very loose source of method of inquiry to test a very tight one. So again, for the same reasons that that simply doesn't pan out. So I would say that you try to use clinical research or clinical observations as a source of evidence for evidence in evidence-based practice fails as it's insufficient of evidence of evidence on the grounds of a paradox of inquiry and increase in risk of bias. So let's take a, a more focused look at the scientific mechanics of evidence. Hopefully most people have read this. It's the most cited and most downloaded article in the last 10 years. Um, why most published research findings are false. So John Yunardis is a Greek medical academic, published a series of papers related to this. This was his explanatory model as to why, how he can explain his previous findings that randomised controlled trials, particularly and observational studies, are more likely to be false than true in terms of some sort of clinical meaningfulness. Um, and here's one of his conclusions. Simulations show that for most of the designs and settings, it's more likely for a research claim to be false than true. So we haven't got time, now's not the time or place to go into the model of how this came about. And LJ has prevented me from explaining these things to you. Um, but, he, you know, further dimensions, what you'd expect. For false findings increase with bias of study, which we, we would have suspected. But also false findings increase with multiple studies. So, when we do multiple randomised control trials or multi-centred randomised control trials, it's more likely that the outcomes of those trials are false than, than true. So they don't inform anything related to um, outcomes. We took this and thought, OK, that's all well and good, but what Unardis did was compare sequential randomised control trials. And we thought, well, that's not how health policy and clinical decisions are made. We should look at the, the bit above that and look at systematic reviews of randomised control trials. So what we did in this study that's just, just been published is take a whole bunch of physiotherapy guidelines and systematic reviews, look at the associated randomised control trials, classify them as positive or negative based on whether they supported the intervention or not, define two truth dimensions, I won't go into that now, but just a, a clinically mean, meaningful truth, 
and then decided how many of the trials were true or false. Um, and around half, half of all trials on both truth dimensions were, were true and half were false, which you can sort of accept. So then we would say, okay, well, which half are true and which half are false? So we asked another question, are higher quality trials true? Can you say truer? Is that a word or is it more true? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> more more truer. -er. <laughs> okay. So we looked at quality variables of how we judge uh, quality of trials, randomised intention to treat blind and sample size allocation. We also looked at how many times a, an article had been cited, the quality of the journal it was in, and the year it was published, and, and wondered if these related to whether a trial would be true or not. There was one significant finding, which was randomisation. So if the trial is randomised, it's more likely to be true than false. And there was one close to significant results, which is intention to treat. If a trial used intention to treat analysis, it was far more likely to be false than true. And note there were no other significant indicators that would say that a good quality trial leads to any sort of meaningful truth. Um, then we asked, the purpose of science is sort of to edge moment by moment towards some sort of truth that you're after. That's the whole purpose of science. So we thought, well, if we're doing good science in physiotherapy, that should be the case. So we asked, do trials converge towards the truth over time? Naught is false, one is true. Both truth dimensions, generally over time, we're converging away from or diverging from. Yeah, so we're getting closer to something that's false than something that's true. And the better, the more recent, better quality trials are driving that force as well. So then we asked something really sort of uh, shop floory and thought, right, so I get a journal, manual therapy journal, falls on my floor and then I open it and I see a randomised control trial. What is the chance that the next trial I read is more likely to be true than false? So with the data we had, we could do some nice funky Bayesian statistics and modelling to answer this question. So we created a Mendola sequence. We asked what is the chance that this trial that I'm reading today is more than 60% probability of it being true. We did to MCMC analysis and the answer was between 4 and 8% of any trial that you read is uh, at least 60% probability of it being true. So anything you read based on our data and you know this is modelling is much more likely to be false than true in some sort of meaningful way. <laughs> So, our scientific analysis offers very good insight that E is likely to be false and is not related to any sort of meaningful hypothesis or theory. So let's go around the clock. Let's look at things a bit deeper. The epistemological dimension. Here's our epistemologically driven hierarchy. This, we think, is given as better knowledge than this about causation, let's say. And this is often used as a cut-off point to say anything below there is looking at correlations, anything that above there is looking at comparatives and using some sort of counterfactual dependency to create causation, and then this is even better. And the, the strongest counterfactually dependent method of establishing causation is at end of one trial. So this is a hierarchy of epistemology. Okay, We can read this epistemologically and try to understand the quality of the data we're getting from, from this. This is the uh, recent grade table, uh, whose um, slogan at the moment is, there are no hierarchies. So they flattened the pyramid into a table and said, look, don't worry about this hierarchy thing. It doesn't really matter. We can do observational studies. We can do randomized controlled trials. We need to look at the quality of each method to see what it's worth. I was at a grade meeting two weeks ago. This is I pinched this slide off the map, took a photo of the slide, and copied it here for your reading pleasure um, <laughs> and they, this is the slogan there are no hierarchies and they said so the first step we do is rank randomised trials as high and observational studies as low <laughs> hello <laughs> uh, so we start with that and then, then we can upgrade observational studies to the status of RCTs what does this do to our epistemology so now we're saying that we can read causation from correlation if the, if the quality of the observational study is robust enough. And that now sort of shapes the foundations of all our belief in what causation actually is. So this is a very epistemologically confusing way of constructing research methods. 
Now for a bit of fun. Okay. A double blind parallel group randomized control trial for retroactive prayer. Remote retroactive prayer. Go to another country, pray for somebody five years ago. Okay? Um, so these guys took a bunch of hospital records from five years prior to the onset of the trial for patients with bloodstream infection. Large group. Randomized them into two groups. Those who would receive prayer in, this was in 2000 and, can't see that one. So in 2001, get two groups. Pray for one group, don't pray for the other group. From 1996, okay? And then um, do, do our analysis and see what happens. Remote retroactive intercessory prayer set for a group from five years past is associated with shorter stay in hospital and shorter duration of fever in patients with bloodstream infection and should be considered for use in clinical practice. <laughs> <laughs> Systematic review of the efficacy of distant healing is supported and uh, warrants further study. So there is syst at least systematic review level evidence that remote retroactive intercessory prayer works. Now, this puts us in, in a really interesting epistemological position. What we can do now is either say, I believe randomized control trials. And if we say that, we have to believe the, the underpinning theory, the T at the bottom there, that remote retroactive intercessory prayer works. We need, to be, we need to believe the theory and the mechanics of that. Or we can say randomized control trials give us statistical accidents, random results. I know where I sit on that. <laughs> um, Adam Lacasse from Queensland's EBM's hierarchy should be interpreted as a hierarchy of comparative internal validity. I think this is the best stance we could get. It's nothing to do with generalization or inference. It's just a hierarchy of how internally valid a bunch of methods of inquiry are. We've had a recent PhD student. Uh, this is one of his uh, comments. Evidence hierarchy should be read heuristically and not epistemologically, and this is a good stance to take. We could use hierarchies and just use them as a shortcut for policy making and not read anything into the meaningful about science or clinical meaningfulness or anything. It's just a little political tool um, to, to, to move us forward as a profession, which it's sort of used as um, anyway. So EBP becomes rhetoric and nothing to do with science or health care. Uh, so that's a nice stance to have. Adam Lacaz again, if EBM is to inform therapeutic decisions, then a considerably more restricted and context dependent of interpre interpretation of EBM's hierarchy is needed. So what he's saying is we need to really sit down and rethink how we interpret findings from the methods of inquiry inherent in our, in our hierarchy. So uh, we could say significant epistemological tensions and weaknesses uh, question the validity of E being E for the E in EBP. Last but not least, the ontol don't worry about the words, the ontological dimension. How do we get from here to here? How do we get from population studies to individual clinical decisions? Because this is, this is what it's all about. So this is the really interesting stuff for me and the purpose of the symposium. So LJ is going to go into some stuff about this. So we won't talk about the age-old ecological fallacy of taking aggregates from populations to individuals, which just doesn't work. Um, we've recently published something on a probability fallacy that says that the frequentist idea of probability here has very little to do with the propensity interpretation of probability here, um, but we'll talk about that another day. What I really want to talk about is another, um, a, another concept we've just had published, which, is, which we'll call the, the causation fallacy, which I'll talk about now. Um, so this is what we're interested in. I said earlier that what we really need to do is make sure that this is firmly in place before we can go thinking about this. So we're right down at the bottom here, getting right down to the real groovy stuff and thinking about what is it that we mean when we say causation? What is it that we mean when we say, I want to cause my patient to improve? I want to do something and that to have an effect. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> causation. The, I could spend three weeks standing here telling you about this because I'm so excited about it, but I'll do it in one minute. 
what essentially all we're saying is the type of causation we get from population studies is different to the type of causation we want with our patients. Okay? So the type of causation we get in population studies, the only defensible position for population studies and their accounts of causal claims is, is something that philosophers out there are very human. In other words, we look at a regularly occurring event and we, we, we look at the frequency of that event and we look how we look to see whether there's temporal priority between the cause and the effect. We always need to see that. The cause must become before the effect. Those two events, those two discrete events, cause and effect, need to be quite close to each other. And they need to occur again and again. And that's fine. That's what a randomised control trial does. And if an observation study is good enough, that's what you can always also read into that. That's the only defensible position for causation from population studies, a frequentist regular, regularities view of causation. But for a patient, that means absolutely nothing for a single patient. We're not bothered in regularities and frequencies with a patient. Causation is something very different with a patient. So we've created a, a model uh, called a disposi dispositionalist account of causation, which is uh, the work of my two co-authors here, Stephen Mumford and Ronnie. Uh, and you. and uh, th this says that causation is something much more complex and context sensitive with a patient and it's a simultaneous um, uh, phenomena the, the, the two events of cause and effect aren't necessarily discrete events what we do for a patient is cr create change in their health and their movement and their pain and their beliefs and everything else but it, it, you can't reduce it down to two discrete events that in some remote distance populations just happens to occur frequently in some sort of um, random population. So I'd urge you to read that. And one or two, you have read it, I believe. Or oh, the first paragraph. Um, oops, sorry, I'm doing. Okay, and this is really, what we're trying to do here is uh, reconstruct the eviden uh, evidential hierarchy for evidence of medicine. So this will be very good, and what we want to do, LJ and I want to create a sister paper of this that is actually readable, and for physiotherapists <laughs> as well. So the ontological position, physiotherapy has structured its EBP in a very ontologically confusing way. Extremely tenuous relationships exist between the evidence, the hypothesis, and the theory. And the theory itself is very fragile and not substantial enough to support that E is anything meaningful to, to the sorts of things we want it to be meaningful for. So, sure, this E up here is evidence of something, <coughs> but not necessarily evidence of the stuff we're interested in as clinical practitioners. And it's much more likely that these sources of evidence are, are close <coughs> to some sort of clinically meaningful um, hypothesis and theory. So I've been the bad guy deconstructing this. LJ is now going to be the good guy and, let's, and, and try and build up these sorts of things. So um, I suppose my conclusion statements would be evidences in research, or at least populations to this, there's no convincing clinical, scientific, epistemological, or ontological evidence that it's meaningfully related to clinical decisions about individuals. Wise clinical decisions should be grounded in other forms of evidence, e.g. patient data and clinical judgment. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you've all written down the words that you would like Roger to um, define for you after that presentation, but thank you, Roger. Um, he always gives me great things to think about, and um, I, I think thinking about the reasons and how we, th how we think about science and what we believe about science is really important because we're claiming to use a framework that is based in science, okay? So we have to understand um, our perspectives and, and how we're using it. So. I'm going to kind of try to bring everything together, and I, I guess it's my job to translate that paper, Roger. Is that, that my job? Um, <laughs> and so Roger's just finished up by, as he said, deconstructing some things, and 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 this is one of the reasons we want to, we want to talk about things. And it, it seems that then with this element, it is consistent with with Sackett's original thoughts that external evidence can inform us. And Roger's sort of talked about the limitations and in, in how it can inform us, and that actually. We're using 
research in a way that isn't consistent with uh, true philosophical, logical, scientific thinking, ontological and, and a few other words. Um, and, and what this means to me is that actually we need to be thinking about how these things can inform our clinical practice. So uh, the question that I want to talk about is how do we make wise clinical decisions because that, that's where it matters. And, and Roger really talked about that individual patient. And then how do the things that we know and how does science tell us about the things that we know and, and how does that inform our clinical expertise and, and where does clinical expertise fit in? So he said clinical expertise is really important and obviously patient values and goals is, is, is prime. Um, but what I'm really focusing on here is the clinical expertise puzzle bubble. So the question is, uh, what is this thing we call clinical expertise? Uh, and, and early on the week, and actually as a theme through the week, we've heard about clinical reasoning a lot and, and how important clinical reasoning is. But there's, there's another thing to clinical expertise, and this is a manual therapy conference. And how we use our hands and our skills is really important, and it has been identified, this is not our definition, but your, your skills and your acquisition of skills and your refinement of skills is a key part of clinical expertise along with clinical reasoning. Um, and, and this comes from a variety of different sources where people who research clinical expertise, and this is actually um, a really nice definition from Josh Cleland and colleagues, that it talks about the, clinic, the clinician's ability to make judgments and apply clinical skills in the care of individual patients, not populations of patients. And I really like this one from Erickson and Smith is that it's our ability to do the right thing at the right time. And ultimately, that's the magic bullet, right? When we get the right thing, the right intervention at the right time, we make change and we witness that every day in our clinical practices. And thankfully, there's a bunch of great people who research clinical expertise. And um, we've heard some good presentations uh, this week from Dr. Norman as well that uh, talked about the different ways we think. Um, and, and what distinguishes a novice from a clinical expert? And uh, this is a great book. Uh, if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. It's from uh, Jensen and colleagues there. You can see the authors um, about what, what differentiates a clinical expert from novices. Uh, it's a beautiful exploration. And they, they identify five key areas, and I'm sure uh, we can think about, uh, we can talk about each of these things at length, but we can't do that today. Uh, knowledge is one key part of that, as you see, one ball in, in the five. And, and there's different types of knowledge, which is what I want to talk about next, because what uh, epistemology is all about is, is how do we know what we know? How do, and how do we prove that we know what we know? Right? Have I defined it right? Okay, great. All right. Um, so uh, we, clinical reasoning and judgment is also a part of what forms our clinical expertise, uh, our, our ability to reflect. Uh, and, and we believe that reflection and metacognitive skills are really important. Uh, and skill acquisition, continued skill acquisition, refinement of skills, uh, and then professional affiliation and mentorship. So, so, the, so we want to sort of keep those bubbles in mind, and I'll come back to them. Now, when we think about what is knowledge, and as I said, this whole field, epistemology, is dedicated to defining and characterizing what knowledge is. Um, so how do we define knowledge? And, and, you know, I had to go to Oxford. I didn't know if I could figure out all of my own definition. And it's basically, well, how we know what we know. It's our intelligence, our intellect. Okay, that's a nice definition. And then there was ones that related to knowing, a, 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 being able to acknowledge a fact, a, a perception of a fact or truth with the mind. Uh, so <coughs> the state of knowing a fact or truth. And then there was other definitions along there, which was about perception. And perception, no, knowledge is about perceiving things with your senses. Now, this is different than with your mind. Uh, your range of mental perception and your awareness. So we can start to see that there's actually quite different ways of knowing, and this is just from Oxford's English Dictionary. So is it about perceiving things? Is it about uh, thinking things in the left side of our brain? What is knowing? And uh, different experts have classified, and, and uh, we've got Mark Jones and Darren Rivett's book there, um, Clinical Reasoning and Clinical Reasoning in Health Professions from Higgs and colleagues there, about the types of knowledge we need to be able to work as a physiotherapist in our profession. And there's, there's generally two types of knowledge. So the first type is where research knowledge fits in. It's called propositional, it's knowing that. And, and, and this is theoretical, um, it's scientific, it's obtained through scholarship, through studies, through research, uh, and it's very, it's more formal, it exists in the public domain. So we have different ways of knowing, and propositional knowledge gives us some of that theoretical base. And often we're learning this in school when we're starting as physiotherapists. But then there's this whole area of non-propositional. 
And this is your experience-based knowing how. And a lot of times when I go to research, when I go to conferences, uh, the focus is based on knowing what, so the, the propositional. But where is this non-propositional piece? And, and I love this term, and, and Mark mentioned it in, in Montreal a few years ago, that, that this is our craft knowledge. This is the art of, of what we do. It, it can often be just inferred. It's you just kind of knew that you needed to do something. You hear clinicians talk that way. It's embedded within our experience in the clinic. It's in our practice. It's, it's, and it's, it's not only individual clinical knowledge. It's, it's our general professional knowledge. It can be specific and related to particular clients and situations. So we're looking at different things. And this is not gained through research. This is gained through experiences, listening, thinking, doing, reasoning reflecting on outcomes and findings and discussing with our peers and trying to figure things out and going, well, when I see that, I, when, that's what I see and this is what I feel and this is what I think. And so it's, it's much sort of less specific and less formal. And uh, this non-propositional knowledge also create, uh, includes a dimension called personal knowledge. And this is one that I'm particularly fascinated with in terms of how we develop as clinical experts and how we develop our expertise piece over our span of our professional lives. And that's because uh, this is about our unique knowledge gained from our personal life experiences. And this very ha has a very significant impact on how we work with the individual patients in front of us. Uh, you all know that you, uh, you have different experiences with patients. There's some who walk in the door and you go, yeah, this isn't going to work. I think you should see my colleague down the street. Because there's something in the interaction, and you may not even be able to describe it, but there's something in your individual interactions on a personal level that you know might not work for the best for both of you. There's your community, your cultural impacts here, and it's shaped by all kinds of your own journeys, uh, whether you take your body through a journey, whether you take your mind through a journey, and it, this is the basis for our interpersonal interactions. Uh, this relates back to your own experiences as a child, in your family, in your social context. So there's so many things that influence this, and yet it's so essential for uh, delivering optimal patient care. And understanding yourself is what uh, Diana and I really feel is what's required to understand uh, your own values, assumptions, and beliefs, and attitudes that you're bringing to that patient interaction. So clinical expertise is, is more than just knowing uh, what the research says about the efficacy of uh, manipulation and the cervical spine for treating neck pain. It, it's much broader, and we need to start framing it that way. And we love Dan Siegel, and this is another great book that you can, can resource. And he talks about our presence, the way we are in a room with a patient, uh, and how we bring ourselves into connection with the people we care about is a very crucial factor in healing and supporting the healing process with our patients. And uh, I'd suggest that probably in physiotherapy we need to start researching more this, the impact of this. And that the clinical interaction is a dance. And as Roger said, it's not this distinct, we do something and then there is a cause and an effect. They're very mingled and mixed together. So I love this from Mark Jones, understanding the person with the problem. It helps us determine meaning and, and what's most important to the patient. And this is different for every single person who walks in the door. Uh, it's, what, uh, uh, it's what Ronald Malzak would call a gestalt of their experience. Uh, everyone has this sort of, uh, sort of flow of awareness of their body. And what we're trying to figure out when we listen to a patient's story is, is what is their current experience. Um, uh, how are you today is a very broad question to give us an impact of where they're at. And because we need to understand what their experience is and how it's different because even if we could create the same painful impairment, every single person's experience of that impairment would be different because of who they are, right? Their beliefs, their emotions, their societal context, um, uh, their culture, their family, all those things pay, uh, play a big part. So the effective clinician is able to understand, to collect all these types of information and knowledge, and to organize all these types of knowledge. And, and this is not an easy thing. Uh, you've just, you're, you're getting into the tail end of a big week with lots of information, and you're going, where do I put this all? So um, Diane and I have some, some proposals about organizing your knowledge, which we'll go into more tomorrow morning. But um, there's, there's, a, there's a large amount of things floating around in your head. And uh, we, we were treated to the whole concept of, well, where does pattern recognition fit in? And um, 
Edwards and Jones talked about pattern recognition being a link between your general biomedical, biomedical knowledge base and the particular specific knowledge found in a, a patient individual interaction with their, their background, their experiences, their context. So um, uh, this pattern recognition helps you pull together some of this information. And of course, pattern recognition can sometimes get us into trouble and, and be what is what we could say, well, you're biased, because every time you see that, you think this is what this is. So we need to have ways to organize our knowledge. We need frameworks to have that bring into to a place where we can access this both existing and emerging new knowledge. And the process of clinical reasoning is what facilitates this integration of our left and our right sides of our brains and the rest of the, the experience that our body is having in the interaction of two beings uh, sitting in a room together trying to um, go on a journey of healing. So this is much broader than what we would consider the current uh, definitions and, and usages of evidence-based practice. Uh, Tonelli is an author who's written uh, quite a bit about evidence-based practice in the literature as well, and he says that the integra this integrating knowledge factor is very, um, very little in terms of a topic that's covered in the evidence-based practice literature. You, you don't read about it, we don't hear about it, we don't talk about it. Uh, and to, fa to quote a very famous person who's probably going to win a Nobel Prize after that paper, uh, there is still an almost exclusive attention towards knowledge transfer of research knowledge. So even when we talk about translation, uh, we, we need to get broader than, than just the, the research. And we have to recognize that we have our own context that we bring to this. So your professional practice knowledge is, is embedded within the wider history of ideas, your history and how you see the world, um, and your broader knowledge of society and the, and the cultural context you're in. There's a very close relationship between what you perceive as important knowledge and important information, I think as Roger quite nicely highlighted, and your history, and then the history of the people you are around and the history of your world, the history of your country, the history of your province. There's social factors, cultural factors, political mm -hmm. factors, funding factors, all kinds of things as to what you will perceive as what's the most valuable <laughs> knowledge and what you will make your decisions on. And then there's your own personal and group history. All these things have huge influences on the way we understand what knowledge is and we have to start looking inside ourselves to see where we put ourselves with all those things because they will affect our decision making. So there's uh, Jim Elliott and Henry Sow at UQ. We're, we're working on um, torturing Jim with some fine wire needles. And um, currently in Western culture, we are in, a, in an era where we believe that scientific evidence is primacy. It's very important. And it, we believe in it as a way to discover truth. And the world has not always worked like this. I know it's hard to believe. But we think that if we discover facts about the universe, if we have data, then it's true. Is this valid? So we have to, th to think about how we think about science. And you know, if you think about what does science mean to you, do you believe that, that science is a unified procedure? That, that it's just this nice box that, that you know, has no bias, it guarantees our knowledge, it, it provides a bedrock for us to move forward as a profession as a society? Well, scientists will tell you that, this is a phys physicist, um, it's a kaleidoscope. It's diverse and it's constantly changing and recomposing. So science itself is changing and changeable. Okay? Do you believe that science uh, is objective and free from bias? Well, the great philosopher Thomas Kuhn said, there is no observation with about a, without a paradigm that directs the observation. And as you saw from Rogers E and H and T, that you cannot believe and you can't observe something without a framework. And this is a type of bias. So our theory influ influences the way we choose to study things, the way we then observe things, and our paradigm affects our viewpoint. Uh, so we can't say that science is fully free from, from bias. And certainly the conclusions we make from science is probably not free from bias. So we currently have a high value placed on science and physiotherapy, this whole thing of evidence-based practice. And we have all this debate about what's more valuable, and Roger nicely showed this whole hierarchy thing. And there are other um, uh, ways of grading evidence that are put out there, but what's pretty consistent is still that expert clinical opinion is still ranked last, or, or put fairly low. And I still hear clinicians walk up to a microphone at a conference and say, well, I'm just a clinician. And we have to, we have to ask the questions of why we're saying these things. So uh, this is from a recent article about how do we implement evidence-based practice in the JOSPT. 
And it, they said that the hierarchy of evidence doesn't exclude expert opinion, which is level five, but this opinion should be considered best evidence only with specific knowledge that higher level evidence does not yet exist. So your clinical experiences, your, your level five evidence is only valuable if there's nothing else that's better. <coughs> And we need to start asking about, well, how are we valuing these things? And, and as Roger so nicely highlighted, that's an assumption that higher level evidence is always right. What if the higher level evidence is wrong? Because the chances of the next RCT being closer to truth are less. Yeah? So, so we have to start looking at our assumptions. And, you know, I have had quite many debates with different colleagues who I highly respect over the years. And one of the other PhD students I was talking to at UQ, and they, she was saying, but we can't just be only practicing physiotherapy based on what the clinical gurus say. We, we, we have to move forward from clinical gurus. And it wasn't me who said this, uh, but it was another very astute uh, physio uh, PhD student. And he said, well, haven't we just moved from clinical gurus to research gurus? Um, are we now just placing our faith in something else? And do we listen or do and, and, and critique and, and ask, the, ask questions of both sides? Because there are valuable things in both types of knowledge and there are limitations in both types of knowledge. And we can't just blindly put our faith in the next thing, which is currently evidence-based practice. So uh, this was a scientist and satirist. And it was interesting, historically, scientists uh, used to be men who didn't uh, need to make a living from science. They were gentlemen. Uh, who are interested in nature, and it wasn't a profession until only recent in history, and that's a whole other discussion on how that influences science. But uh, he talks about how, with most men uh, and women, uh, unbelief in one thing springs from blind belief in another. So what are we throwing away? And has the pendulum swung too far in that we are putting too much value on the research ball? And uh, this is from Austin, Austin Bradford Hill, who actually is, is quite an um, uh, influential person in policy decision making in the UK. Uh, and he was, uh, at the time, in this very uh, strong position uh, of policy making. And he said that any belief that the controlled trial is the only way would mean that not only had the pendulum swung too far, it could come right off the hook. So the notion that evidence can be reliably placed in hierarchies, is, as Raj illustrated, is illusory. It's an illusion. It's simple, but it's not valid because uh, RCTs have advantages, but they also have significant disadvantages. And we need to understand what those are when we're interpreting the results from them. Um, we are using hierarchies to replace judgment with pseudo-quantitative, over-simplistic uh, ways of, of figuring out what the evidence tells us. And we actually need to incorporate our judgment. So we can't get out of using this thing called clinical expertise. And perhaps my favorite quote is from Jules Rothstein, who in the forward of the first edition of Expertise in Physical Therapy said that evidence without clinical expertise is as useful as a supercomputer in a rainforest. The site might be impressive, but it isn't very useful. And uh, we, we really uh, appreciate and applaud the, the efforts of the conference organizers here who've always tried from the beginning to make this I found a very good blend of both the science and clinical expertise. So we have to look at where are we with these two balls and valuing these two balls within evidence-based practice. And the debate will probably continue, but there are people who have argued that practical knowledge is far more important and has primacy over scientific knowledge. So these, do these balls sit together next to each other, or is one more important? And modern society has been unreasonably dominated by this cognitive, left brain framework of science. And other forms of knowledge have been downgraded. It's anecdotal. It's not real knowledge. Uh, and yet, what we know is that the, the scientific knowledge is limited and has so nicely uh, shown it, uh, um, with um, the, the discussions this week and the presentations is that our patients are becoming more complex. We, we need solutions that are not discreet. We need knowledge beyond science. And being a good Canadian, um, I want to share with you next just a very short story uh, about the cod fish. You know, I'm not in Newfoundland, but um, we're, we're east, so here we go. Uh, this is from a program which I would highly recommend you look up. Uh, it's a podcast series from CBC Radio's Ideas. Um, on how to think about science. And this is just one of 18 different podcasts. And, and actually, I was listening to this series when I first met Roger, so I was quite excited. This is an interview of a scientist named Dean Babington. 
and the whole issue of what happened to the codfish industry. Now in July 1992, in Canada, the Fishers Ministry, John Crosby, uh, announced a moratorium. They closed the codfish industry, and it was the largest single day job loss in the history of Canada. And they thought they were just gonna close it for a couple of years, but to this day, the codfish have not recovered. And it's an example of scientific management of, an, of a resource of nature. And in fact, the role of science, as you see up there, is quite strong in this, in that the scientists were really trying to predict how many fish you could catch. You know, the codfish industry was plentiful, and uh, John Cabot, when he first sailed the waters, they had trouble getting their boat through because there were so many fish. And I don't know if any of us can really conceptualize that, really. Um, I have a hard time thinking about water so full of fish that you can't move your boat. Now, what they have discovered in retrospect and looking at, well, what happened? Why did we think we could calculate the annual sustainable yield, how many fish we can catch, and there still be enough fish every year for everyone to catch, not only just Canadians, but in the international waters where the codfish were, and how many fish were sustainable. So they had to create a model that would predict what the average codfish did, how many times it made it, how many eggs it would have, how big it would grow, how much we could catch, and when should you catch it, and when were the females spawning so we would avoid catching females when they were spawning so we wouldn't catch all the baby fish so we still have to get, yeah? So they had to figure out a huge bunch, huge bunch of variables. And they thought they did a pretty good job. Uh, but clearly, they didn't. And the problem was is that there's actually no average codfish. Um, and this is because what they figured out later, years later, as studying codfish is actually the, the act of fishing, one, changed the codfish. So codfish adapted to the fishing practices that were being done. So the intervention uh, changed the codfish. Uh, as well, the, the estimates they did, they actually found out later that the codfish actually spawned several times a year. And in some bays, they spawned at different areas of the year. And in some bays, you could fish several times uh, in sequential years. In other bays, there would be no fish later. And what was really interesting in this story to me is that the local fishermen who knew which bays to go to in which years and in which bays to leave alone for two years to let them to recover were saying all these things to the policymakers and saying, you can't keep catching this many fish, the fishers is in trouble. And so the local fishermen were saying, there's no more fish. And the scientific studies, when they were going with the trawlers and catching all this fish and making estimates, were saying, oh no, we have lots of fish, we're gonna have lots of fish for years to come. And so there was a discrepancy between the anecdotal evidence of the fishermen and the scientific calculations uh, that were based on catches and different things out there in the ocean. And what they did was ignore the anecdotal evidence and proceeded to let people caught, catch lots of fish, and we still have no fish. So um, the clinical lab, the analogy for me, and I tell you that story is because <laughs> anecdotal evidence may be anecdotal in its stories, but it's highly valuable. And actually, Jeff Norman's talk this week really showed us the value of stories and experiences and recognizing patterns for integrating both two types of reasoning, left side, I think of it as left side and right side of the brain. Um, clinical experience are essential for making wise clinical decisions. And I love David Butler's quote is that he talks about how a clinician can gain 10 years of experience in one year or one year of experience in 10 years. So I would put some questions about this 10,000 hours, just to put a bug in your ear, because um, actually there's recent studies in neuroscience that question this 10,000 hours thing. Um, because if it really does depend, some recent studies have shown with violinists actually, that how you focus your attention while you practice in one hour or 10 hours makes a big difference on the areas of your brain that are activated. And this would fit with David Butler's clinical observations of some practitioners with 10 years in one year only, okay? It's also a place where we integrate and, and, in it and innovate, and we can provide, um, this is a quote from, from Mark Jones and, and Edwards, and that professional craft knowledge can provide innovative, cutting-edge evidence. So we can't just say that research will provide us with all the answers. And restricting <coughs> practice to only what's in the science uh, is the route to stagnation for our profession. And I would also suggest less than optimal outcomes for the, our patients. And this afternoon, uh, Diane and I are doing a workshop on the thoracic ring approach and where manipulation fits into that. And that, la that, that whole approach over the last, of more than a decade has come out of the clinic. So how do we make wise clinical decisions? There are many situations and problems that clinicians face that are yet to be researched, and that's well accepted. 
Um, the problem is there's also times in many situations where the clinical experiences that we have conflict with the research findings. And in fact, there are also findings when the research findings conflict with the research findings. So how do we make decisions? And how we make decisions is by um, having wisdom. And this is the ability to exercise good judgment in the face of imperfect knowledge. And whether it's our clinical experiences or the research that's out there, it is all imperfect in some way or another. And in order to be wise, to do the right thing, not only in terms of the physical interventions we do, the personal education and emotional interventions we do, but we have to think about the ethics and socially and our role as a profession in society. Um, and this is a book on the neuroscience of wisdom, which um, just captured me, of course, as I was writing this speech. And they talk about the fact how emotion actually plays a major role in how we reason, and that, how we, how, that wisdom may actually have a lot to do with knowing when emotion is helpful and knowing when it's not. So to think that uh, clinical expertise mm -hmm. is just about making logical decisions with the left side of your brain is quite in error and not in uh, accordance with the current evidence that we have from the scientific literature. And this is a great quote from uh, Dan Siegel in Mindsight, and I won't read the whole thing, but it does highlight that this thing called intuition, which I think is actually greater than pattern recognition, uh, as Greg Cook mentioned this morning, that intuition is actually being uh, scientifically understood now from a mechanistic point that it's coming from all areas of our body and that the, there's neural networks that are around your heart, that are around your, your intestinal tract that give you not only uh, information about your own body but a heartfelt sense and a gut feeling about the right choice. And I'm sure if you reflect personally that the times in your life where you've made decisions based by just analysis and looking at all the things in the left column and the right column and making analytical decisions have not been your best decisions. That when you listen to your heart and your gut, you combine that with the left side of your brain and you got the best decision. So where do we go from here as a profession and with evidence-based practice? Well, there's lots of things we can think about. We need to recognize that knowledge gained from research is limited. All types of knowledge have strengths and weaknesses. And it's informative to have research evidence, but insufficient for our clinical decision making. And uh, evidence-based medicine, even though it's placed a, a very good priority on knowledge gains from research, we need to start looking at the other ways that we uh, can learn and that we know and that help us in the care of our individual patients. And, and this is from a Tinelli article that, I love this about clinical practice guidelines and protocols because we have to ask the question as well, if we implement these guidelines, what does that do from a liability point of view? What does that do from a negligibility point of view? All those kinds of things. There's, there's big questions. And he says that clinicians must be trained and allowed to deviate from clinical practice guidelines and their protocols. So we need to be trained to deviate. Um, uh, and clinical practice guidelines need to be considered as well in terms of like, should we subgroup, should we not subgroup? And I can't be uh, a more uh, fitting quote than Gwen Jolly in her opening keynotes who said that to mandate a certain subgroup directed treatment approach is perhaps too inflexible because we haven't got sufficient knowledge. We don't know enough about the complexity of the system, which is what they know now about the codfish and they didn't know 30 years ago when they were making the, uh, the rules about the allowable catches. So we need to understand interactions, interrelationships, and we need better ways of studying things. What's next for evidence-based practice? Well, there's some people, this is from the Tonelli article, who would say we just need to reject it. It's time to get something else. It's no good. It's, it's, it's not, not taking us where we need to go. We need to develop a more inclusive model for clinical practice, a more medicine for the whole person. And Gwen alluded to this in terms of just testing separate interventions in certain subgroups. Um, we could make research more personal now. This is talking about the medical field, so he's talking about genomic information. So there are countries in Europe that use a medical screen, a ge genome screening before they will use pharmaceuticals in children because obviously if you get it wrong, there's much higher risks of, of having a child die from the wrong drug. And, um, you know, Gwen talked about that we need, we still aren't there yet, that our RCTs, we don't have enough knowledge to base them on to test the effectiveness of truly what we're doing in a clinical reasoning setting. We're not best at designing studies that test the clinical dance between a patient and a therapist. But in the meantime, we need to find a way to incorporate the imperfect knowledge generated by research with the other forms of knowledge that make, help us make the best choice for the patient. And we must continue to rely on clinical judgment we have to negotiate these potentially conflicting types of information and that will help us arrive at the best decision. And as Gwen said, 
the way forward, the future continues with an informed, clinically reasoned assessment approach to direct management of the individual patient because this is responsive to new knowledge and evidence, it's flexible and allows for change and growth. And I really want to think about this assessment part because we have to develop not just our ability to read the research and apply it, but to develop all dimensions of expertise. And this includes our skills, this includes our clinical reasoning, this includes our ability to talk to other professionals around us, to reflect, uh, to increase our personal knowledge. And so to raise the bar in physiotherapy, to be better than we already are, is that we need to think about other aspects and dimensions of what we do. What about touch? And I had, a, I had an experience sitting on a plane, as I often do, talking to the person next to me. And she was a computer scientist from UQ. And she sat, she stood up, put her stuff in the overhead, and had put a book down. And it was The Neurophysiological Constructs of Memory and Learning. This was the book. And she sat down, picked up the book, and I said, that looks like an interesting book. And she looked at me, and she goes, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> and so that started a long conversation as we started talking about the different things, and because we're very interested in neuroplasticity and apply it into our model. And she was sort of looking at me and kind of getting a strained look on her face. And I, she looked like she was getting neck pain. And I said, do you have a sore neck? And she said, yes, it's terrible, because I really want to talk to you, but I can't turn my head that way. <laughs> so I kind of squished forward in my seat, turned around and looked at her, and we kept the dialogue going. And she said, you know, it's really interesting. I've seen lots of physiotherapists and massage therapists, and you know, they're all really nice, and they all really have great intentions. And she says, but you know, not all of them have the touch. Do you have the touch? What's the touch? Are we researching the touch? Have you seen any studies in physiotherapy research that go, why does my touch feel different to a patient than your touch? When we apply the same standardized grade three mobilization to the L4-5, it feels different. You all know what different touch feels like. And some touch is, well, we call it seducing the joint. Um, some, some touch is different. And, and we need more science and mechanistic research around studying touch. Um, and we need to raise the bar on our touch skills. And, and related to this is, is increasing our perceptual skills. And um, this is a book by a neuroscientist named Norman, Norman Rosenblum. And he writes a book called See What I'm Saying. And it's all about how perception is actually an integrated thing. It's not living separately in your brain. We integrate all the information from our senses to create one perception and judgment. And he says, this is not my word, that all of you have exotic perceptual abilities. And I would argue that skilled manual therapists who are, have, who are said to have magic golden hands are the ones who have developed their exotic perceptual abilities. And uh, in terms of doing skilled assessment to guide our clinical reasoning, as Gwen said we need to, you, you need to be able to find the finding. And Diane always says on our courses that you can't interpret a finding and clinically reason a finding that you can't find. So are we all finding the findings? And I would suggest we need to continue to develop our perceptual and touch abilities. We need to share our stories. We need a way for clinicians to be encouraged and supported to publish their case studies, uh, to share their experiences, because there are some things that are rare, uh, especially cervical artery dysfunction, and, and we don't want to be the, have that presentation that we miss by sharing and publishing our case studies. The N of 1 studies, the single case studies, are a really valuable form of evidence for clinicians to make wise clinical decisions. It's a way to increase our library of pattern recognition and stories. And it, it also uh, it il illustrates different reflective processes in the way different clinicians think. Um, and I would just say, how many years of clinical expertise do you gain in each year now as a, as a novice or as an advanced practitioner? And you need time and logistical space to reflect to do that. So I really believe in science. I think science can help us understand the nature of and how to best develop our clinical expertise. And we need to move beyond just looking at our CTs. And we need to consider what we do as manual therapists and what we do as physiotherapists and that intricate, complex interaction of physiotherapy. Uh, that's the way forward in terms of blending these things. We need multiple kinds of research from qualitative studies to single case studies. Um, and, and that will actually probably help us design those better quality RCTs that really reflect the art and science of what we do. And I think to do this, we need to change a bit of the hierarchy, that the, the clinical voice should be given a bit more value. Uh, we need to enhance our relationships, find ways to have better knowledge exchange and mutual respect, because we have much to learn from each other. So 
Um, I think we'll actually be much better equipped to join this journey if we all increase our personal knowledge. And I would highly recommend Dan Siegel's book in terms of learning how to be mindful in, ter in our interactions. Do you understand the places we come from? Because this guides our interpersonal relationships. And he has a book, uh, a series on uh, interpersonal neurobiology because this helps us be open with possibilities to be aware of the present moment without being judgmental, which is what we need for our patients and for each other, and enables us to be flexible and receptive. And this will help us to be clinically effective from the inside of ourselves to the outside. So why is clinical decisions, what do we need? Well, I think the three balls isn't enough. I think there's a lot more things from exotic perceptual abilities to the best available science, to clinical reasoning, to mentors, to the ability to organize our knowledge. These all influence our ability to make wise clinical decisions. And as a profession, we need to find ways to not only research, to study, but to implement and increase the growth and development of all these things for all of us. And the other thing that we absolutely need is we must make sure we all have a growing armor. <laughs> So the history of human life and culture is told as the story of a gradual and relentless probing of the adjacent possible, with each new innovation opening up new paths to explore. And it has been our hope that this uh, Focus Symposium would open dialogue and discussion to help us to <coughs> continue to explore the next step in the adjacent possibilities, not only for evidence-based practice, but for where science and clinical expertise fit for our profession. And I must close this topic um, with the greatest scientist of all, uh, who has two good quotes for us, that everything that can be counted does not necessarily count, and everything that counts cannot necessarily be counted. Because imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. And with that, um, I would just like to close. There are many people to thank. Um, my patients, my partner Diane, the experiences I've had with the group at UQ, and my interactions with Roger, who I'm sure you all really enjoyed his presentation. And we will now um, have a time for questions. So thank you.